This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. In feedback this week, a series of investigations into some of the great broadcasting mysteries of our time. First, the mystery of the empty chair, waiting for someone from the Today programme to fill it. Then there's the case of the missing women in radio comedy. BBC TV bosses say never again will there be men-only panel shows. Will Radio 4's Commissioner for Comedy make a similar commitment? In radio we're not, because although we're not complacent, I don't want to be smug about it, actually we don't have to. And while the Brits and Bowie were all over the headlines on Thursday morning... What about the, to many, much more significant awards being held on the same night? And welcome to the 2014 BBC Radio 2 Folk Awards here at the Royal Albert Hall. We begin this week with climate change and genetically modified foods and what many of our listeners feel is the poor and inconsistent treatment of them by Radio 4's Today programme. The BBC's science coverage in general is apparently of high quality and significant quantity. That was the conclusion of an independent review carried out several years ago which also highlighted the Today programme's particularly strong output. But coverage of science on the Today programme, not once but twice in the last two weeks, has irritated many feedback listeners. Last week we heard complaints about this discussion on whether recent heavy rain had any link to global warming. Here's Sir Brian Hoskins, a government climate change advisor from Imperial College in London. There's a number of reasons to think that such events are now more likely. And one of those is that a warmer atmosphere that we have can contain more water vapour and so a storm can wring that water vapour out of the atmosphere and we're seeing more heavy rainfall events around the world and certainly we've seen those here. So it's the heavy rainfall... Opposing him was the non-scientist Lord Lawson, former Chancellor and co-founder of his own global warming think tank. We need to abandon this crazy and costly policy of spending untold millions on littering the countryside with useless uh, wind turbines and solar panels and moving from a sensible energy policy of, of having cheap and reliable forms of energy to a, the, a f policy of having unreliable and costly energy. Well, Give up that. Many listeners vehemently questioned Nigel Lawson's qualifications for taking part in that discussion. But the Today programme responded last week by insisting in a statement that the discussion and their overall coverage of climate change remains fair, balanced and impartial. Oh, no, it doesn't, say many of you. And listeners' concerns increased when, on Monday, the Today programme invited two speakers to discuss GM blight-resistant potatoes. Peter Kendall of the National Farmers' Union and Lord Haskin, a trustee of Rothhampstead Agricultural Research Centre, were both in favour of the development. There was no dissenting view. But boy, it should be a game-changer. Game but my concerns is, unless we change the regulatory and political deadlock in Europe, we're not going to see these fantastic advances actually being delivered at a farm level. Mm. But you can buy... You actually reduce the use of, of herbicides significantly, and that will, of course, should appeal to the public. It should, certainly should appeal to the organics. Because... Now, what the Today programme would do in such circumstances were the item, for example, critical of government policy would be to invite a minister on and to make it clear if they refused. So, three days ago, we asked the Today editor, Jamie Angus, to respond to your criticisms. But he was not available. Instead, as you guessed it, they sent us another statement, an even bigger one than last week. What will our listeners make of that? Out of the 27 pages of critical emails we received, we invited three of those listeners to consider the Today programme's answers to feedback listeners' questions. John Screen, you're chairman of Credit and Devon Pro Green Group, and you said that you were appalled by the Today discussion involving Nigel Lawson. Why? If the BBC wants to put the balance where it does lie, it could much more usefully bring on two scientists who could talk about things that are... There's loads of things that scientists are not agreeing about when it comes to climate change altogether. Some would want to put uh, what limited money that government seems to put onto this into modelling so that we have better um, view of what is actually happening. Others want to get on with mitigation. Well, the BBC's defensive, I'm going to put in, is that they would not, I think, and Lord Lawson would not agree as a climate change denier. He would simply deny that the evidence is there to conclusively link 
climate change with human activity. Well, let us explore that evidence. And to do that, you need to get people with relevant expertise to discuss it. Well, the BBC again, the statement from today, accepts that Lord Lawson is not a scientist, but as a former Chancellor of the Exchequer, it says, he's well qualified to comment on the economic arguments, which are a legitimate area for debate. In other words, not about what causes climate change, but what we can now do, if anything, to mitigate it. I would not deny him the chance to talk about the economics of it, but that's not what he was doing. A couple of years ago, the BBC Trust sought advice on how it should cover science from Steve Jones, a scientist. And he said that it was not true impartiality to have exactly as we heard somebody who's not a scientist talking about scientific matters with a scientist. This isn't a balance of equals. Uh, Can I now bring in Chris Padley, uh, a Green Party member who is uh, very concerned, obviously, about the discussion involving Nigel Lawson, but also concerned about the discussion on Monday's Today programme about GM foods. What was your concern there, Chris Padley? It's the contrast between the way the two questions of balance were dealt with. On the one hand, we were told that to have somebody who is, as I put it, an extreme gainsayer, on to, it was counter Brian Hoskins, wasn't it? It seems to be the way that it's thought to achieve balance. But on this GM one, we had two people on, again, as in the the climate change one, but they were both of exactly the same point of view. And we missed the real debate and the really interesting area by going to the opposite extreme. The BBC, I think, at that point would say, there is no direct evidence on GM that it is harmful. Is that right in your view? To simply say as if there's only one issue on GM and it's sort of is GM good or is GM bad is an absurd simplification and it's to get at that, hunt out those real debates where there is genuine differences and there are genuine arguments is what I would like to see happen. Let me put specifically what the BBC says about GM crops. The Today Statement says our report asked whether there was a shift in the debate around GM crops as a result of recent trials including including those on genetically modified potatoes. We represented a range of views on the subject, including those of a major food retailer and the farming community, and we are satisfied that the piece was fair and balanced. You're not. Why? Well, I think it's, that statement is simply demonstrably untrue. There was clearly not a range of views. It just seems to me factually incorrect. Can I now bring Rowan Adams in here from the Isle of Wight? Uh, you were again critical of the Today programme's defence last week of Nigel Lawson. You said it, to his appearance, wasn't defensible. Why not? Because he's not a climate scientist. And I think if we need to find solutions to a problem, we first need to find out the facts, the causes of the problem, and only then decide what to do. And so for that, we need climate scientists. If the Today programme could find a climate change scientist who criticised the view of the vast majority that there is a link between human activity and climate change, you would think, would you, it was proper to have them on as long as you didn't have them on that often? I think that would be reasonable. And the important thing then would be to make sure that the people doing the interviewing had some understanding of the science. I think it's entirely reasonable that we all have something to say on the issue of climate change because it affects us all and we're a democracy. Our thanks to John Screen, Chris Padley and Rowan Adams. And the editor of today says he will come on feedback sometime in the future. Now, still on the question of impartiality, coverage from Sochi. We're not one. Oh, are we supposed to do that? Probably not. Arguably a bit over the top. But if our inbox is anything to go by, TV commentator Amy Fuller's enthusiasm about Jenny Jones' slope-style victory was actually rather refreshing. On the radio, however, as you'd expect, dear listener, the commentary has been rather more dignified. But was there enough coverage on radio? Hello, my name's Andrew Mason. I'm from Ilkley in West Yorkshire. Unfortunately, I've found that the uh, radio coverage of the Olympics has been extremely limited. For example, when Lizzie Arnold went for her gold in the uh, Skeleton Bob, the coverage of her own run was fantastic, but there was no coverage of all the other competitors going, even in the final run, which did rather take away from the the tension and, and drama of the situation. It's been very frustrating turning to Five Live Sports Extra 
only to discover that there is no output from that channel and it's not being utilised for any sport when it could quite easily have been used for more extensive coverage of the Sochi Olympics. The BBC's other output has been absolutely fantastic through the Games, but I think maybe radio listeners have been rather left behind and forgotten about. Richard Burgess is the BBC's head of sports news and radio sport. I put Andrew Mason's point to him. I think we made the decision to concentrate on the key moments, the success stories around Team GB. We did a number of kind of previews and reviews, the big interviews around the events. I'm not Uh, denying you did a great deal, but there are listeners who want more. And, for example, Five Live Sports Extra seems to have lain dormant for most of the Winter Olympics. We made the decision that better to focus on the big moments on Five Live and get them on our main network, which is what we've done and which is what the audience research shows us that the audience mainly wants. And you see it as well in the TV viewing figures. That's when they start to spike around those big moments. That's what we focused on on Five Live. People like BBC to be comprehensive and to bring the audience things they wouldn't otherwise know about. For example, Andrew mentions border cross snowboarding. (laughs) I didn't even know that existed. (laughs) But, you know, if the BBC won't cover it, who will? Well, we have covered it, of course. And I think you need to see Five Live's coverage in the round. So there has been extensive coverage on BBC Two, uh, six live streams on the BBC Sport website. And the Winter Olympics isn't quite the same as the Summer Olympics. So the Summer Olympics, there are a lot of medals to be won in a day. Whereas in the Winter Olympics, there's often only kind of five or maybe six gold medals to be run during a day. So it's difficult to do that kind of extensive commentary when there isn't necessarily going to be British success as well. Can I ask you about the commentary? There have been lots of criticism of BBC television's commentary and how shall we put it, the over-enthusiasm of some of the reporters or, to be honest, simple partisanship. Do you have different standards in radio from television? There's been a lot of praise for the for the television commentary as well, by the way, from viewers. Um, yes, but specifically there has been some criticism where they thought this was just a cheering club. I mean, yeah. do you do you say to your commentators, you must be impartial? Absolutely. And I think it's a balance because I think you need to reflect the excitement, the enthusiasm, the passion around the events. I don't think it would be right to sit there and be entirely po-faced around British success. And I think ultimately, absolutely, the commentators have got to retain a degree of impartiality and accuracy so that the audience trusts them. Well, to be fair to you, uh, we have had correspondents who enjoyed on radio... BBC's commentary coverage of Jenny Jones. Terry Dunn, for example, loved the coverage of Will Perry and Team GB snowboarder Jamie Nichols. I just thought that the commentary captured the excitement of the moment extremely well. She is down, which means Jenny Jones (laughs) will take a bronze medal at the Olympics. Bearing in mind it was a sport that I have absolutely no knowledge of, uh, found it very, very difficult to even picture But really, that just didn't matter. I just thought the commentary generated its own excitement. Absolutely incredible. There we have it. History on BBC Radio 5 Live. But listener John Ashton found it a bit too overexcited. He says, this is an event new to most listeners. The commentary did not describe the course in detail, nor explain the acrobatics taking place. This is particularly difficult for radio, isn't it? Because with a new sport, the audience probably won't know what you're commentating on. So do you have to do much more? I think there's an art to radio sports commentary where you do have to describe what's happening. But at the same time, I don't think you can go into kind of minute detail and describe every last kind of incident and aspect of the event. You've got to equally reflect as I was saying before, the excitement and the enthusiasm and the actual achievement. That's all part of the art of of radio commentary. Richard Burgess of BBC Sport. So thanks to everyone this week who's been in touch. By the way, when it comes to making official complaints to the BBC, there's good news and bad. The BBC Trust has found that changes to the corporation's complaint system have led to quicker response times. But satisfaction about the content of those responses for those who submit them via a web form, has gone down. So the BBC has promised to work on that this year. In the meantime, I'm all ears, and if there's anything you want to share about BBC Radio, good or bad, please email me at feedback at bbc.co.uk or you can leave a phone message on 03 333 444. Standard landline charges apply, but some mobile networks might charge more. 
You can tweet me at BBC R4 Feedback or send me a letter to Feedback, PO Box 67234, London SE1 P4AX. All those details are on our website. Now, last Wednesday, there was a big music award show. No, I said music. It was, of course, the Radio 2 Folk Awards at the Royal Albert Hall. Ladies and gentlemen, the Musician of the Year Award goes to... I don't need to look at this. It goes to Aidan O'Rourke. Ah, that's better. And there were performances by Bellowhead, Suzanne Vega and Clanad to follow, not to mention Martin and Eliza Carthy. Folk music has enjoyed an increasing mainstream profile in recent years. But how well is Radio 2 responding to that? And what is its future across BBC Radio? Diana Butler is a feedback listener and folk fan. She joined me at the Albert Hall a couple of hours before the awards and I asked her what she wanted to find out. I think I'd really like to find out what is Radio 2's understanding of folk and is part of the Radio 2 policy to actually have more folk is the aim to bring it much more into the mainstream. Well, that's a fair few questions uh, for us to answer this evening. I hope we'll be able to, uh, and I think we'd better get inside. We've now come into the auditorium of the Royal Albert Hall where Bella Hood are rehearsing. The fact that they're here at the Albert Hall, a big band like that, in a place like this, it's just the perfect place for them. We've just crept out of Bellahead doing a sound check and we've come outside to meet Al Booth, who's head of specialist music at Radio 2. Are you nervous tonight? A little, a little nervous. This is a very big deal. You know, it's the first time we've been at the Albert Hall. Yeah, it's only the third time we've ever done the awards in front of an audience as well. What is Radio 2's classification for folk now? Folk music to me and to our audience is something which has its roots, I would say, based in tradition, primarily acoustic based. But that's a huge, massive spectrum. Does Radio 2 have a folk playlist? The folk show chooses its music on a week-by-week -week basis. So we don't, have, we don't say, right, well, this is the folk records that we're going to play on mainstream Radio 2. But we do have, a, obviously, a Radio 2 playlist. And what's happened this year, particularly, is that Bellowhead have become part of that mainstream playlist. Seth Lankman's new single, that's also on the mainstream playlist. So, Diana, you're standing here, you know, about to see the folk wars, and what do you think about the way that things are at the moment? I think the introduction of Mark Radcliffe on the folk show has been a breath of fresh air. I think he's broadened what is played. Um, what I'd just like to see is that reflected more throughout the Radio 2 schedule so that, you know, we would have folk on a regular basis on, say, Steve Wright in the afternoon rather than just, you know... Bellowhead and Chris Evans occasionally in the morning. So, Albu, is she pushing at an open door? Is that what you're going to do? Absolutely. And, and if you listen tomorrow, Diana, you will, there will be folk tracks in across the day tomorrow because we'll be obviously uh, celebrating what we're hearing tonight. And there's a lot of presenters from Radio 2 coming tonight who are passionate about the music as well. So it feels as though we are moving in a good direction. But we've now come down to the dressing room occupied by Bellahead. It looks like the dressing room of a football team that's in the lower divisions, I have to say. <laughs> and with me are three members of Bellahead. I'll ask them to introduce each other. My name's John Spires and I play all the squeeze boxes. And my name's John Bowden and I uh, play the fiddle and sing. And my name's Paul Sartin and I play the oboe and the violin. Diana, what do you want to ask them? I think that the boundaries have blended together and the folk show brings a new audience. You are in the cutting edge of this. Do you think that as well? Do you? I think folk music has always been in flux and there have been times when mainstream and folk have crossed over. Certainly with the mainstream media support that we get from, for instance, Radio 2, it's helped to push folk and roots music more into the mainstream, so we're getting a wider demographic now. When they put one of our songs next to some of the other pop songs in the charts, then that gives us a massive boost in a way that no internet coverage can. Thanks very much. Thank you, well, thank you very much. Well, we're now in Mark Ratcliffe's uh, dressing room, which is extremely luxurious, about the size of the average small loo in a very small house. <laughs> and can I ask you, Dana, when you heard that Mark was going to take over as Mr Folk for the BBC, what did you think? I was really pleased because, to me, you come from a sort of an indie music background right. and the fact that you're on radio to say that you like 
folk music has allowed me to be much more public about saying I like folk music. If there's one thing I don't like about doing the folk show, it's that it's a specialist programme, and I hope that if my name, as you say, known with from indie music and all kinds of music, my taste has always been very wide, mm. that it would bring people in who wouldn't think a folk programme would be for them. So I'm glad you've been able to come out. <laughs> <laughs> I have always thought that music radio stations did listeners a disservice, because most of the people I've ever met are much more open to a wider range of music than it is assumed that they will find acceptable. But I was just talking to Martin Carthy, being at the, the Royal great Albert Martin, Hall. the Carthy, great Martin yes. Carthy, who's having a lifetime achievement award tonight. And it seems astonishing he's not had one before now. And, and he was saying, but of course, in the sixties, we played here all the time because folk was massive. It was the hippest thing. Darren, do you think that a radio program is still crucial now? I mean, you can go on Spotify and get any music you like. I think it still matters. I think having somebody like Mark who can introduce you to music that you might not have come across is essential, certainly for somebody like myself. I've thought about this a lot because once it became possible that you could download any track in the world that's ever been made, that's great, but it's a bit bewildering. So where do you start? You kind of need someone to hold your hand and say, well, try this. Streaming may well be the future, but I think there will always be need for a voice that you trust and can kind of lead you through these things. And also, with something like a folk show where we have live sessions on, and folk, perhaps, out of all the musics, is most suited to the live acoustic intimate session. There's still something very special about thinking those people are in that little room in Salford doing that now. Well, you can hear, I think, the buzz of excitement around it, and I certainly share it. I think Diana probably does too. I can't wait to see Clanad and their Lifetime Achievement Award, but also just all the new uh, music that's going to be out there tonight. I'm just so excited about the whole evening. Hello from Julie Fowlis and me, Mark Radcliffe. I, for one, am really pleased to see such a resurgence of our interest in our musical history. Um, of all the aren't you glad you practised moments, this is the ultimate, I would say. The highlight was definitely Bellowhead. Clanad, you know, they did Harry's Game. It just sounded like they'd sung it yesterday. <laughs> They just melted away the years, and it was just wonderful. But I have to say, what really impressed me was the, the winners of the BBC Two Young Folk Award, which went to the Misha McPherson trio. Um, we also need to say a, a very big thank you to Strav, Alison, Lachlan, Roseanne, um, Paul and Sheila. I'd love you to think that that's our team of fancy international agents and masseuses, but they're not. That's our mums and dads. And <laughs> without their love and support... Louder. I really enjoyed this opportunity to come and see how it's all put together and to talk to people like Al Booth at Radio 2. I have for a long time, you know, sort of shouted at the radio, wanting, why don't you play this, why don't you play that? And I really understand now how, how the system works and I really promise not to shout at the radio anymore. No, it's dark. My thanks to our listener, Diana Butler, and to Bellahead, Mark Radcliffe, and everyone at Radio 2. Now, testosterone fueled TV comedy panel shows with token women will be a thing of the past, according to a recent announcement from Danny Cohen, the BBC's head of television, who's promised that there will be no more such all male shows on BBC TV. What about Radio 4? Well, some women are already in place. For example, The News Quiz and Dilemma are hosted respectively by Sandy Toxvig and by Sue Perkins. And most of the other shows regularly have at least one female guest. But some feedback listeners think there is still much room for improvement on Radio 4 when it comes to having more women on comedy panel shows. Caroline Raphael is Radio 4's commissioning editor for comedy. I asked her if she'd consider issuing an edict of her own, mirroring that of television's Danny Cohen. No more all-male panel shows on her network. No, we won't. Um, I'd first of all actually say that I think we should be applauding Danny for being honest about the situation as he perceives it in television. But I can only speak for radio. And in radio, we're not, because although we're not complacent, I don't want to be smug about it, actually, we don't have to. You don't have to. Why not? Because if you listen to a large number of shows, you will look hard to find the women, and when you find one, it will be one. I did a count of over 100 shows that we've broadcast this financial year up until almost today. And 
every single show, bar a very few exceptions, had at least one woman on the show, and some, possibly not enough, had two women. Well, and a, several of the shows are also hosted by women, so a very, very small number of exceptional shows had no women on them at all. You could be interpreted as saying, well, in many shows, 25% of the panellists or others are women, and that's enough. No, that's it's not enough. That's a very enough. strange view to take, no, isn't it? No, no. What I'm saying is that um, there is uh, work to be done, but on the whole, we're really proud of our shows. And as I said, quite a few of them will actually have two women on them. And about a quarter of the shows, slightly half, actually have women hosting. So if there are only 25% of women, participants, panellists, whatever, that doesn't bother you? You have no ambitions to increase that? We have ambitions to be in a position where... I don't spend an afternoon counting up who's actually been in our shows and I don't have to come on feedback <laughs> to talk about it. But seriously, no, there are 50% women in this country, possibly more. And, of course, why wouldn't you aspire to be ambitious, to have the biggest range of voices and ideas and opinions on our panel shows? Every producer has that ambition. Well, they have the ambition. They're obviously failing then because of the figures that you yourself acknowledge. I mean, let's take, uh, for example, I'm sorry I haven't a clue. In the latest uh, series, uh, out of eight programmes, there was a woman on only two of them because it was the same woman, Victoria Wood. Do you have the producer of that programme and say in and say, look, this simply isn't good enough? We talked to the producer, but I think Clue is a slightly different show. And by that, I, I mean this... Graham and Tim and Barry are clue. So there is actually only one position to fill each week. Oh, well, they apart do from the chairman, you've chosen a new chairman, well, relatively new, of course, a man. He's very good, people like him, but that was an opportunity. So it was an opportunity, and women were tried and women were asked, and that's where we ended up, with the best person doing the job. And, as you say, Jack has stepped into it effortlessly and is incredibly popular. So, yes, we should be pushing for other women. We talked... To the producer, in fact, we talk to all producers all the time, and there is work in hand. And what we're saying to producers is we're really proud of our record so far, but we are now going on to the next stage, which is, OK, what can you do on top of that? So I would hope, if you were to ask me back in a year, that the situation um, will look different. Caroline Raphael. Well, that's about it for this week. Next week, we're going behind the scenes at BBC Radio 1, which is flinging open its doors to hordes of young listeners. Why? And is Radio 4 about to give some listeners sleepless nights with its production of The Exorcist? Jeremy Howe, Radio 4's commissioning editor for drama, and Gaynor McFarlane, the producer and director of the two-part horror story, will be in the feedback studio to answer your questions post-transmission. So, let me know what you make of it. I'll be leaving the light on. And checking under the bed. Goodbye. A government climate change advisor from Imperial College in London. There's a number of reasons to think that such events are now more likely. And one of those is that a warmer atmosphere that we have can contain more water vapour and so a storm can wring that water vapour out of the atmosphere and we're seeing more heavy rainfall events around the world and certainly we've seen those here. So it's the heavy rainfall... Opposing him was the non-scientist Lord Lawson, former Chancellor and co-founder of his own global warming think tank. We need to abandon this crazy and costly policy of spending untold millions on littering the countryside with useless uh, wind turbines and solar panels and moving from a sensible energy policy of, of having cheap and reliable forms of energy to a, the, a f policy of having unreliable and costly energy. Well, Give up that. Many listeners vehemently questioned Nigel Lawson's qualifications for taking part in that discussion. But the Today programme responded last week by insisting in a statement that the discussion and their overall poor and inconsistent treatment of them by Radio 4's Today programme. The BBC's science coverage in general is apparently of high quality and significant quantity. That was the conclusion of an independent review carried out several years ago, which also highlighted the Today programme's particularly strong output. But coverage of science on the Today programme, not once but twice in the last two weeks, has irritated many feedback listeners. Last week we heard complaints about this discussion on whether recent heavy rain had any link to global warming. Here's Sir Brian Hoskins. Will Radio 4's Commissioner for Comedy make a similar commitment? In radio we're not, because... Although we're not complacent, I don't want to be smug about it, actually, we don't have to. 
And while the Brits and Bowie were all over the headlines on Thursday morning, what about the to many much more significant awards being held on the same night? And welcome to the 2014 BBC Radio 2 Folk Awards here at the Royal Albert Hall. We begin this week with climate change and genetically modified foods and what many of our listeners feel is the... This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. In Feedback This Week, a series of investigations into some of the great broadcasting mysteries of our time. First, the mystery of the empty chair waiting for someone from the Today programme to fill it. Then there's the case of the missing women in radio comedy. BBC TV bosses say never again will there be men-only panel shows, 